Hi, in this 18th part, we'll deal with the following topics starting with assessment of quality of bone during implant placement. So which of the following methods gives us more accurate picture? So it's obviously CBCT. We'll review some literature and see if it is helpful for you. The recent technology used for dental implant imaging is CBCT as it provides rapid acquisition of data with little radiation exposure. It generates images replicating those used in daily clinical practice. Therefore, due to greater advantages associated with CBCT or other techniques, it's a technique of choice for implant imaging. Also, I'll share the link of this article. You'll find plenty of useful and relevant information. So we'll review some literature from the very same article in case of periapical radiography as you can see the quality of bone assessed is not so accurate so as mentioned here it's of limited value in accessing the quantity and quality of bone as well as in depicting the spatial relationship between the vital structures and proposed implant site and what about cephalometric radiography also it's clearly mentioned that it fails to demonstrate the quality of bone right and we have other methods like if you take complex tomography even it's mentioned that it's of not any importance in determining bone quality right what about ct so it helps to determine both bone quality as well as bone quantity right see if this literature is helpful in answering your question now moving on to the next topic zinc phosphate cement setting which ion plays an important role so I, I think those were the keywords uh, which I received in one of the mails. See if that's the question which was asked in exam. So it's aluminium. So if you look into the literature given in Philips, zinc phosphate cement consists of powder and liquid which are mixed just before use. The powder has the following composition and liquid has the following along with phosphoric acid. We also have water, aluminium phosphate and zinc phosphate in some cases, etc. So when mixed phosphoric acid dissolves the zinc oxide which reacts with aluminium phosphate and forms zinc aluminophosphate gel on the remaining undissolved zinc oxide particles. So the set cement contains unreacted zinc oxide particles encased in an amorphous matrix of zinc aluminophosphate. Right? So this is some information pertaining to setting of zinc phosphate cement. Now moving on to the next question, clinical features of anag. Uh, I think that was a question asked in your exam. Anyways, check out the keywords and let me know if you need any additional information. So acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis has the following clinical features. Bleeding painful gums, ulcers, receding gums, halitosis, metallic taste, excessive salivation, difficulty in swallowing or talking and including fever right moving on to the next question neonatal meningitis which microorganism is implicated let's review some literature there is difference in the implication depending upon uh, the socioeconomic status in developed countries it's different in developing countries it's different anyways review the following literature so in spite of development of rapid diagnosis of pathogens and new antibiotics neonatal meningitis contributes to neonatal mortality and morbidity worldwide neonatal meningitis is inflammation of meninges during the first 28 days of life so based on the time of diagnosis it's either classified as early onset or late onset in early onset clinical features appear during the first weeks of life in case of late onset the clinical features are seen between 8 to 28 postnatal days so coming to microorganisms in developed countries group B streptococci are the most common cause of bacterial meningitis accounting for 50% of all cases E. coli accounts for another 20% whereas in developing countries gram negative bacilli such as Klebsiella and E. coli may be more common than GBS especially in late onset meningitis so review this literature see if it is helpful in answering your question right moving on to the next topic I guess they have given you the values of SNA and SNB and the clinical relevance maxillary or mandibular prognathism or retrognathism so anyways review the following the literature so in case of maxillary positioning normally SNA is between 80 to 84 degrees in case of maxillary retrognathism it is less than 80 in case of maxillary prognathism it's more than 84 mandibular positioning the normal values of SNB are in the range of 78 to 82 degrees mandibular retrognathism it's less than 78 degrees in case of mandibular prognathism SNB SNB is more than 82 degrees right moving on to the next 
question skull differences in case of males and females just observe the following images along with this literature so in case of females the skull is smaller and lighter in case of males it's obviously larger and heavier and in females we have rounded forehead especially the frontal bone in case of males the frontal bone is sloping less rounded and in case of females the supraorbital ridge that is bro it is smooth in case of males it is prominent supraorbital ridge the orbits are round in case of females that is the sockets eye sockets and in case of males they are squarer comparatively and sharp upper eye margins in case of females blunt upper eye margins in case of males pointed chin in females square chin in males sloping angle of jaw that is obtuse in case of females acute or vertical angle of jaw in case of males right moving on to the next question exercise induced rhabdomyolysis i think there is a case based question pertaining to this so if you review literature what is this exercise induced rhabdomyolysis excessive or intense exercise beyond the extent of personal or physical limits may induce various types of musculoskeletal damage including exercise induced rhabdomyolysis or pathophysiological condition of skeletal muscle cell damage so in this case there is increase in serum creatine or myoglobin seeping into the bloodstream through damaged cell membrane resulting from excessive or intense exercise it may lead to acute renal failure liver dysfunction compartment syndrome heart failure erythema electrolytic imbalance and in severe cases can also lead to death right moving on to the next question restrictive lung diseases what are the altered parameters in terms of vital lung capacity so if you review the following literature first expiratory volume or timed vital capacity it is slightly reduced in some respiratory diseases which are restrictive in nature take for example fibrosis of lungs and also peak expiratory flow rate that is pefr even this is used for differentiating obstructive from restrictive to lung diseases right the reduction in pfr is more significant in obstructive diseases than in restrictive diseases this is some additional information see if this literature is helpful in answering a question pertaining to the alteration in parameters especially related to restrictive lung diseases moving on to the next question types of respiratory failures we have different types of respiratory failures type 1 to type 4 so as you can review the literature respiratory failure is characterized by reduction in function of lungs due to lung disease or skeletal or neuromuscular disorder it occurs when gas exchange at lungs is significantly impaired to cause a drop in blood levels of oxygen leading to hypoxemia occurring with or without an increase in carbon dioxide levels that is hypercapnia so we have different types of respiratory failures so these are classified mechanically based on pathophysiologic derangement in respiratory failure so type 1 is hypoxemic respiratory failure type 2 is hypercapnic type 3 is respiratory failure typically occurring in perioperative period type 4 respiratory failure results from hypoperfusion of respiratory muscles in patients in shock right now moving on to the final topic what if palladium is not added to addition silicon what could be the consequences in terms of making cars so if you review literature as given in philips addition silicon also called as polyvinyl siloxane or vinyl polysiloxane in contrast to condensation silicon the addition silicon is based on addition polymerization between divinyl polysiloxane and polymethyl hydrosiloxane no reaction byproducts are formed as long as the correct proportions of divinyl polysiloxane and polymethyl hydrosiloxane are used and there are no impurities however residual polymethyl hydrosiloxane in the material can lead to secondary reaction with each other or with moisture to produce hydrogen gas technically hydrogen gas is a reaction by product that doesn't affect dimensional stability of impression however hydrogen gas evolved can result in pinpoint voids in gypsum cars poured soon after removal of impression from the mouth so manufacturers may add a noble metal such as palladium which acts as a scavenger for the released hydrogen gas right so these are some of the topics which i wanted to highlight in this specific video so if you have any additional keywords drop them in the comment section or if you need any additional information let me know in the comments we'll update them accordingly in the description part of the video wish you all the best love you all